All right, welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, as you've probably guessed by now, we're going to be talking about everyone's absolute favorite part of every urgent care shift, uh, the emergency department pelvic exam. So the role of the eMERGE pelvic exam has come under debate for quite some time now. Uh, a lot of clinicians have raised concern about whether or not it actually changes their management plan uh, and whether our findings are reliable. Of course, there's a ton of logistic barriers when completing the eMERGE pelvic exam. So, you know, the room availability, the chaperones that you need, um, there's just a lot of barriers. And so there's been a lot of talk about whether it's all the time. Um, today, we're going to focus on three main objectives. There are a lot of different angles that we could take uh, for this talk today. Um, but we're going to talk about the pelvic exam, mainly in early pregnancy bleeding, suspected ectopic pregnancy, and pelvic inflammatory disease. We're also going to review the updated PID treatment guidelines. Uh, and finally, I hope to empower you with some tools to provide the best possible patient care around the time of the pelvic exam. Throughout the talk today, I'm not actually able to see the chat, um, but I do have a couple people keeping an eye on it in case questions come up, and we'll definitely have time for questions at the end. So just a bit of a disclaimer, um, at some point today, you may disagree with something presented, and that's completely okay. There's a lot of practice variation in regards to eMERGE pelvic exams. We don't actually have sufficient high quality evidence to completely unify our practice pattern. Um, but we are going to look at some selected papers, some practice patterns, and try and tease out some helpful features to help you make your decision um, and to help guide your discussion with your patients around the public exam. We're going to start with early pregnancy bleeding. So defined as under, under 20 weeks gestation, uh, this is where there's been sort of the most organized effort in the literature to figure out whether or not an eMERGE public exam is really necessary. Um, early pregnancy bleeding happens in approximately a third of pregnancies, uh, and about half of these cases go on to uh, result in pregnancy loss. A population-based study in Ontario in 2020 reported that about 40% per of pregnancies at some point present to an emergency department, um, and an American study showed that 1-2% to 2 of all emergency department visits were related to early pregnancy bleeding, which works out to about seven patients per day at TOH. So what are we doing right now? We're gonna start off with a case. Uh, this is a case that I sent out in the survey last week. So we'll go through it again, just to remind you, or if you didn't have a chance to look at it before. Um, it's a 31 year old patient, G1P0, who is nine weeks gestation. They've had three days of intermittent spotting and occasional lower abdominal cramping. They're hemodynamically stable. Bedside ultrasound confirms an intrauterine pregnancy. Do you recommend a pelvic exam? So before we get to our survey results, uh, I just wanna go through a few cases where um, there's really not much debate at all about whether or not an exam is necessary. So reading across emergency department literature, obstetrical guidelines, and discussing general practice patterns with eMERGE physicians and obstetricians, there's general agreement that a pelvic exam is necessary in patients with heavy vaginal bleeding, unstable vital signs, uh, any concern for vaginal or cervical trauma, or when another diagnostic entity is suspected that requires a pelvic exam for diagnosis, for example, PID. These scenarios are all excluded from the emergency department literature that debates the exam's necessity. In patients with heavy bleeding or unstable vital signs, the speculum exam can facilitate the removal of blood clots or tissue at the cervix, which can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. If seen, blood clots or tissue should be removed using rings, forceps, and sponges or gauze. Some of the obstetricians I spoke with in preparing for this talk actually also reminded me of um, cervical insufficiency, which is something that needs to be considered in second trimester patients presenting to the eMERGE. So this is when the cervix opens prematurely in the absence of labor and can lead to miscarriage or preterm delivery. It's detected either by ultrasound or by seeing an open cervical oz on exam, 
The second trimester patient should be worked up in the department because if cervical insufficiency is identified in an otherwise viable pregnancy, these patients need obstetrics consultation in the department for consideration of cervical cerclage. This diagnosis especially needs to be considered in patients who have had previous second trimester pregnancy loss. So just going through the ultrasound photo on this slide here, um, there's an example of cervical insufficiency. So the picture on the left shows a closed cervix, and the picture on the right is actually the same patient um, when there's a bit of fundal pressure applied. And so you can see the baby's head here and then the amniotic fluid that's sort of descending down into the opening cervix. But let's get back to the more common presentation that we talked about in our case. So there's a lot of practice variation for the patient who had some bleeding that has now slowed or who's having maybe some ongoing mild spotting and minimal pain. Thank you so much to everyone who filled out uh, the survey. I had lots of answers and they rolled in very quickly, which was wonderful. Um, we can see here that about two thirds of us are foregoing the pelvic exam in this stable population altogether. And about 15% are almost always doing one. The piece of the pie over on the right there, um, the multicolored part, that's uh, people who added in some qualifiers or some extra things that they wanted to know um, in order to help make their decision. So there have been multiple sources that do not agree with the mission of the pelvic exam. These include obstetrical textbooks, Rosen's itself, um, many opinion pieces that have been published in response to some of the emergency department literature, as well as the SOGC guidelines. So the SOGC states that the exam is needed to rule out alternate sources of bleeding rather than the threatened abortion itself. These could include lacerations, foreign bodies, polyps, or undiagnosed malignancies. And in their guidelines, the SOGC has gone on to directly call out the emergency department literature that we're gonna to discuss today. They state, there have been efforts in the emergency medicine specialty to scrutinize the utility of pelvic examination in the context of early pregnancy bleeding when ultrasound is readily available. The authors caution interpretation that the pelvic exam is unnecessary in this situation. The literature we're about to review is not high quality. It is not the robust evidence that we rely on when we change our practice patterns away from clinical guidelines. But messages from some of these studies have been amplified across several FOMED platforms, opinion pieces, and blogs with really catchy titles like, why are you still performing pelvic exams? It's really tempting to skim these posts and feel well supported in deferring the exam. One of the articles goes as far as to claim that the evidence against this practice is extensive. I'm not saying that our current practice is wrong, but I think it's valuable to look at it critically and understand which of our decisions are being made based on experience and practice pattern versus which decisions have a high quality foundation of evidence, especially when obstetrical guidelines contradict our usual practice. In the emergency department, our mindset does revolve around ruling out dangerous causes of a presentation and determine what needs to be acted on in the moment versus what can be cared for by specialists at a later date. So naturally, the emergency department view on the necessity may differ from the obstetrics point of view. The first study that we're going to briefly touch on was a 2009 review article that summarized the existing literature at the time. It had 43 studies, with observational cohort studies being the highest level of evidence included. Overall, the authors determined that the pelvic exam does not provide further diagnostic information over ultrasound and beta HCG testing, with the caveat that this was based on low quality evidence. Next came a 2011 study by Dr. Brown and colleagues this was a prospective study of 183 patients with lower abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. And the study actually included both pregnant and non-pregnant patients. Providers in this study were asked to predict what they expected on the pelvic exam. And then this was compared to actual findings of the pelvic exam. Providers then indicated whether the findings on exam changed their management. So in this study, 72% of exams were as predicted, 
22% of exams were not as predicted but did not change management. And 6% of exams actually had findings that changed the clinical plan. Unfortunately, the details surrounding the changes in plan were not described in detail. These authors concluded that given 94% of patients did not have a management change, there might be a subset of patients in the eMERGE who do not require a pelvic, but that further study is warranted and they did not outright claim that a pelvic exam is unnecessary. This paper is quoted in a lot of the opinion pieces that we talked about by both those who support pelvic exams in the eMERGE and those who don't, basically based on whether or not you feel supported by 94% or concerned about the 6% of patients who did have clinical management plans changed based on the exam. Next team, a study uh, with 135 patients who presented with first trimester having a pelvic exam or not. Attending physicians were asked to provide provisional diagnoses following the initial assessment, so after history and physical, and then this was compared to diagnosis following transvaginal ultrasound. The primary outcome of this study was the accuracy of provisional diagnosis. The accuracy of the provisional diagnosis was poor in both groups at 57% meaning whether or not the patient had a pelvic exam, the initial clinical assessment correctly predicted pathology about 57% of the time. The authors concluded that since the pelvic exam did not change accuracy of the diagnosis, it would not lead to management changes or disposition plan changes. And in patients who have access to ultrasound, there is really no role for the pelvic. This study does support our current majority practice, and it suggests our decision-making may not change as a result of a pelvic exam. There were some limitations to this study, including that it was underpowered to detect its primary outcome. And the outcome of diagnostic accuracy requires us to extrapolate that it wouldn't result in management changes. And there were also no patient safety-oriented outcomes like return visits or future interventions. The last study we're going to look at here for early pregnancy bleeding is the Linden study. Um, so this was a randomized controlled trial. It's actually pretty excited when I read the abstract of this study. I thought we were going to like finally get an answer to this question, um, but I was wrong. So this was a prospective open label randomized equivalence trial uh, that was published in 2017. So the most recent data we have. It included 202 patients under 16 weeks gestation with confirmed intrauterine pregnancy. And they were presenting either with lower abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. So patients were randomized to either receiving a pelvic exam or not. And the primary outcome was actually a huge composite outcome of all of these things. So unscheduled return visits, need for further intervention over 30 days, need for emergent procedure, transfusions, admissions, identification of an infection, or identification of another source of bleeding. As we know, composite outcomes are not ideal. Each component does not necessarily the case, does not necessarily carry the same weight. For example, is an unscheduled return visit for someone who's having some ongoing bleeding that we never fixed in the first place, really the same as someone who needs a transfusion or an emergent procedure? The composite primary outcome occurred in 22% of patients in the control group. So that's the group that had a public exam. And 16% or sorry, 19% of the group without an exam. So statistically, they couldn't actually claim equivalence. Uh, the predetermined accepted confidence interval that was calculated statistically was negative eight to eight. Um, and unfortunately, this study was also significantly underpowered. So unlike the people in this photo, people were really not dying to participate in the study. The authors doubled their recruitment period and ultimately ended up with only 202 out of a required 720 patients. Some of the reasons for exclusion uh, were related to the study design. Uh, for example, not having a translator at a center that was primarily non-English speaking, or not primarily, but had a significant number of non-English speaking patients. And then other reasons for exclusion introduced a potential for bias. So for example, the physician declining to enroll the patient or the classic catch-all category of other, which had a lot of people in it. 
Interestingly, uh, there were 184 patients who declined to participate in the study. Nearly half of them said it was because they did not want a pelvic exam, compared to four patients who declined to study because they did want a pelvic exam. Ultimately, the authors were not able to conclude equivalence. And although the evidence we went through just now maybe sort of suggests some support for our current practice, it's not high enough quality to give us a real evidence-based leg to stand on. So where does this leave us? I don't think you're ever wrong to offer the pelvic exam. At the end of the day, we don't have evidence that can fully unify our practice pattern or a few guidelines. But where I think we can make a difference is in our ability to improve the discussion we have with our patients regarding what the pelvic exam can and cannot offer. So we're gonna go through a bit of an outline. When discussing the pelvic exam your, with your patients, I recommend we include the following points. First, let's acknowledge the lack of evidence. A pelvic exam may or may not change our next steps here today. Discuss the therapeutic potential with your patient. If there are blood clots or tissue at the cervix that we can see and remove, we may improve your symptoms. And finally, approach the concept of alternate diagnoses. So rarely, there are other causes of bleeding unrelated to your pregnancy, such as polyps or injury to the cervix or vagina, and we can't actually identify these without an exam. Ultimately, like everything, this will be a shared decision between you and your patient. I thought it would be useful uh, as I was reading and interviewing, since we didn't have any like solid evidence to help guide us, um, that I was making my own framework in my, in my mind for cases where I'm choosing not to do a public exam. So obviously this isn't validated in any way, but I'm hoping it might help you take a moment to pause and reflect on cases where it might be worth those extra few minutes to arrange for, to get the room that you need and take those extra few minutes to do the exam, even if it's a pain. So for patients I'm sending home without an exam, they need to be first trimester intrauterine pregnancy with stable vitals and minimal bleeding. There needs to be no history of trauma. They have to have adequate pain control and they should have an STI screen in the department, whether it's with urine or um, self swab. We'll talk about that a bit later. And most importantly, patient needs to have access to reliable, timely follow-up, whether that's with their GP, their obstetrician, or arranged through us at the early pregnancy clinic. Also, I want you to consider doing an exam, even in low-risk cases, for patients who have had little to no recent medical or gynecologic care. These patients are at higher risk of delayed diagnoses of polyps or malignancies. We're gonna switch gears now and briefly touch on ectopic pregnancy. So when a pregnant patient presents with lower abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding, our main concern is often to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopics occur when a developing blastocyst implants to any surface other than the uterine endometrium. 90% of ectopics are tubal, meaning they implant at the fallopian tube. Ectopic pregnancies are estimated to occur at a rate of two to 3% of all pregnancies, but it has been estimated that the prevalence of ectopics in the pregnant emergency, de population, emergency department population could be as high as 7%. And we know that a ruptured ectopic can be a life-threatening emergency. So let's take a look at another case from our survey last week. Um, so this is a 31-year-old patient presenting with lower abdominal pain. Two days ago, they had a positive home pregnancy test with the last menstrual period about five weeks ago. Bedside ultrasound does not clearly show an intrauterine pregnancy. Vital signs and CBC are normal, and their quantitative beta HCG is 1600. And I asked you to tell me your next step. So I'll give you a moment to read that in case you prefer to read than to hear me read it. All right, um, thank you again for completing the survey. 
So, and for this question, I really do apologize for how restricted you all felt by my provided answers. There were a ton of separate explanations that were submitted in regards to how you make your decision, which was excellent. Um, about 65% of us are getting ultrasounds in the department. So radiology performed ultrasounds while the patient is there in the department. And about 30 to 35% are doing pelvic exams in the eMERGE. I do wanna give a shout out to the POCUS group um, who sent in some replies about transvaginal POCUS. And I'm sorry, I did not give you this option on my survey. Um, but many of you who submitted unique answers wanted more information to make the decision, including the extent of the patient's pain and bleeding, their risk factors for topic pregnancy, and the presence of free fluid in the abdomen. Several people also specifically asked me for the pelvic exam findings. Let's just quickly go through the TOH early pregnancy bleeding algorithm before we talk about the pelvic exam. So this gives us obtain the RH status, the quantitative beta HCG, provide analgesia, and screen for both STIs and domestic violence. Uh, next, the steps that we take from here are based on the location of the pregnancy. So in a stable pregnant patient with an intrauterine pregnancy that's confirmed either by POCUS or radiology performed ultrasound, it's suitable to get outpatient follow-up with either the family physician, obstetrician, or dedicated early pregnancy evaluation clinic. If they have a non-viable pregnancy and are interested in medical or surgical management, you can talk to gynae in the department or send to the early pregnancy clinic. Or depending on where you work, some, uh, sometimes the eMERGE physicians are initiating medical therapy as well. And if ectopic pregnancy is detected on ultrasound, then that's easy. We're going to talk to the obstetricians in the department. If your radiology performed ultrasound does not reveal the location of a pregnancy, meaning you have a pregnancy of unknown location, the decision for inpatient versus outpatient gynecology consultation is based on your clinical suspicion for a topic. I know there's lots of practice variation in regards to getting an ultrasound in the department versus sending to the early pregnancy assessment clinic for them to arrange an ultrasound. That's not really what we're going to discuss here. But what we will explore is some data regarding whether or not the pelvic exam findings help us at all in our risk assessment. So the role of pelvic and ectopic pregnancy I know has come up a bit over the last couple of years in a couple M&M discussions. Um, so I was curious to see if we actually had any data on this. And it turns out luckily this time we do. Um, so this time we have a systematic review. The JAMA Rational Clinical Exam Series published a review in 2013. They conducted comprehensive Medline and Enbase searches for all studies reporting on the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy from 1965 all the way through to 2012. Ultimately, they had 14 studies that met the inclusion criteria, totaling over 12,000 patients. To be included in the study, they had to be like big enough studies. So they had to have at least 100 pregnant patients presenting with either abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. They had to have results from the patient's history, physical, labs, and ultrasound. And the diagnosis had to have been confirmed either by direct surgical visualization of the ectopic or clinical follow-up to prove that the ectopic was not missed. The sensitivities and positive likelihood ratios for various physical exam findings are described here. So cervical motion tenderness and peritonitis had the highest positive likelihood ratios of about 4.9 and 4.5 respectively. Unfortunately, all physical exam findings had poor sensitivity. Transvaginal ultrasound, on the other hand, the sensitivity of 88% and a positive likelihood ratio of 111. The authors concluded that transvaginal ultrasound was the single best diagnostic test when assessing for ectopic pregnancy. What do we conclude from this? So a normal or abnormal pelvic exam does not change the need for a transvaginal ultrasound. The overall risk stratification obviously is gonna take more things into account. So that's gonna have your patient history, risk factors, their current symptoms. But I think what we can conclude from this is that a normal pelvic exam does not help you classify someone as low risk. Uh, 
All right, we're gonna switch gears again and talk about PID. So here we're gonna go through um, some nuances around PID diagnosis, uh, as well as the updated PID treatment guidelines. So pelvic inflammatory disease is an infection of the upper genital tract involving any combination of the endometrium, fallopian tubes, and pelvic peritoneum or contiguous structures. We all know that the pelvic exam findings are key to a PID diagnosis, so we're not going to debate the necessity for the exam. Any patient with the uterus and lower abdominal pain should have PID on their differential. PID is diagnosed based on clinical criteria. So these are the CDC criteria that I have here. Um, the minimum criteria include unexplained lower abdominal pain plus one of either cervical motion tenderness, adnexal tenderness, or uterine tenderness. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada has some different guidelines listed. Um, so here they list lower abdominal pain, adnexal tenderness, and cervical motion tenderness as their minimum criteria. But they don't really provide any information about how many of these should be present or you know, what the likelihood is if you have one, two, or three. I find them a little bit more vague and harder to interpret. Um, and we know that diagnosis is nuanced. So it's very much up to the provider interpretation of the physical exam. We know that the pelvic exams themselves can be and often are uncomfortable. So how uncomfortable can you be before we call it adnexal tenderness or uterine tenderness? Naturally, there's gonna be some variation. There are some additional diagnostic criteria to help us out, including uh, fever, vaginal discharge, cervical friability, elevated ESR or CRP, the presence of white cells on wet mount of vaginal secretions, and laboratory confirmed infection with gonorrhea and chlamydia. Unfortunately, there is no single historical, physical, or laboratory finding that is both sensitive and specific for PID. To add to the dilemma, only about a third of patients have fever. Organisms that cause PID can be sexually transmitted or not. They can be endogenous organisms. And the diagnosis puts patients at high risk of future complications, including, but not limited to tubo ovarian abscess, chronic pelvic pain, ectopic pregnancy, and infertility. Also, negative swabs do not rule out PID, which is unfortunate. So cervical pathogens such as gonorrhea and chlamydia make up about 50 to 85% of cases, depending on where you look. Um, but there are many other organisms in the literature that are quoted to lead to infection of the upper genital tract. These include enteric and respiratory pathogens, as well as endogenous organisms, such as those frequently responsible for bacterial vaginosis. There are some risk factors for PID that can help sway us towards the diagnosis. So having four or more sexual partners within the last six months increases the risk of PID by about a factor of three. The highest frequency of PID infections occurs in those with female anatomy ages 15 to 25. A history of PID or previously diagnosed STI increases the risk for subsequent PID. And recent instrumentation such as IUD insertion or saline sonohistogram can increase the risk of infection. A note quickly just on IUDs, so insertion only raises the risk of infection for about the first three weeks, um, and beyond that, the risk is baseline. So there was a large prospective study uh, back in the early 90s that identified the risk of tubal factor infertility in patients with PID to be just over 10% overall. The risk of tubal factor infertility increased with the number of episodes of PID with infertility rates of nearly 40% after three episodes. This risk was even higher if you were over the age of 25 at the time of your first episode of PID. And PID is reported in many sources to be the leading preventable cause of infertility. It's proposed that a significant number of PID cases go unrecognized and untreated. The CDC states this could be as high as two thirds. Multiple studies of women with tubal factor infertility have shown similar scarring and microscopic changes among cohorts of women who have and have not had formal diagnoses of PID, 
suggesting that PID or another etiology of tubal injury at some point had not been diagnosed. So why is it so hard? Um, there have been some interesting studies, most of them sort of in the early 2000s, um, that really started to take a look at the different features of the pelvic exam. Um, so they tried to look at things like inter-rater reliability, sensitivity of exam findings, as well as the rates of physical exam findings for various presentations. Um, the one we're just going to quickly look at here is in relation to PID, uh, is an older study from 2001 um, by Close and colleagues. And they sought to determine the inter-rater reliability of public exam findings in the emergency department. So it was a small study. It included 186 patients. Um, attendings and senior residents who decided that a public exam was necessary as part of their patient assessments did the public. And then they would get another physician to repeat the exam. And then um, there was agreement of findings between the two physicians that was assessed. So the primary outcome was basically the agreement between the two physicians. Under 50% was deemed poor prior to the start of the study. So agreement on exam findings overall ranged from 71 to 84%. But in positive exam findings, the agreement was only 17 to 33% with the lowest agreement of 17% occurring for the detection of cervical motion tenderness. I understand that this is a single, relatively small study. I think this would be a really interesting area of future study um, because we do have a bit more faith in ourselves than this study suggests. So this was the question on my survey where I asked everyone to rate how confident you were out of 10 in your assessment of cervical motion tenderness. We did get a really wide, a wide range of responses, um, but it was skewed towards the more confident end of the spectrum. In regards to exam findings, I did speak with many of our ob colleagues for some help. So they recommend just straight up asking the patient to differentiate between discomfort or pressure versus pain on exam, and that true cervical motion tenderness should be quite painful. But if you remember back to the diagnostic criteria that we talked about, you can have cervical motion tenderness or uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness. There was a study in the mid 2000s that showed the addition of adnexal tenderness to these minimum diagnostic criteria increased the sensitivity of diagnosis from both the mid 80s up to 95%, which is why it's part of the CDC's basic criteria. So I asked some ob colleagues about those tough cases where you've ruled out alternate pathology for the patient's pain. They're a bit more tender on one side than the other, on the bimanual, and you're not fully convinced the patient has cervical motion tenderness. One of the docs I spoke with told me given it's an ascending infection, it would be a bit odd to have adnexal tenderness without cervical motion tenderness. But ultimately, we know there's variation in presentation. And if PID is your most likely cause, then you're certainly not wrong to treat it. So we're left with a difficult diagnosis based on exam findings with potentially poor inter-rater reliability that we highly suspect is undertreated and can have a significant burden of disease if left untreated. What do we do? Personally, I plan on increasing my suspicion and lowering my diagnostic threshold for PID. Any patient of reproductive age with a uterus and unexplained acute lower abdominal or pelvic pain should be screened for gonorrhea and chlamydia, undergo pelvic exam if agreeable, and considered for diagnosis and treatment of PID, even if your physical exam findings are equivocal. Now that we've struggled through making this nuanced diagnosis, how are we going to treat it? Luckily, if you've tuned out because things were too wishy-washy up until this point, now's the time to tune back in because we have good guidelines to help us here. So the CDC guidelines recently increased the ceftriaxone dosing uh, for two, from 250 to 500 milligrams for coverage of gonorrhea. This is based on resistance patterns and the amount of time that serum concentrations remain above the minimum inhibitory concentration, or the MIC. 500 milligrams is the lowest dose that was recently found to be 100% effective at eradicating gonorrhea 
in individuals up to 100 kilos. For patients over 150 kilos, the CDC actually recommends we increase our dosing to one gram. And according to the survey I sent out, about almost half of us are doing this already, so you're ahead of the curve. For doxycycline, um, there have been no recent changes, so continue as you were. Doxycycline has been recommended for chlamydia coverage in PID over azithromycin for several years now um, by the CDC, Public Health Agency, and uh, TOH. The Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as a lot of resources that describe PID management, often leave the decision of adding metronidazole up to the provider. The reason it's been debated is that anaerobes are often identified in the lower genital tract, but their exact role in PID and the sequelae of infection are not entirely known. Recently, very recently actually, 2021, um, there was a randomized placebo-controlled trial that compared ceftriaxone, doxycycline, and metronidazole with ceftriaxone and doxy alone. So this study enrolled 233 patients diagnosed with acute PID, and the primary outcome was clinical improvement at three days following enrollment, which was similar between groups at 90 versus 96%. But they had a bunch of secondary outcomes, including the presence of anaerobic organisms in the endometrium and clinical cure at 30 days. Pelvic organ tenderness on abdominal and pelvic exam was still present at 30 days in 9% of patients in the metronidazole group and 20% of patients in the placebo group. There was also decreased rates of bacterial vaginosis in, in the metronidazole arm at 30 days. This study here is one of the main contributors to the body of evidence that has led to the CDC's recommendation of adding metronidazole in all PID cases. And so does our favorite TOH infectious disease expert, Dr. Paul McPherson. Uh, I just wanna just say thank you briefly to Dr. McPherson and Rosemary from Pharmacy, because they answered a lot of questions for me over the last few weeks to months. So uh, here are the new TOH guidelines summarized that we just talked about. Um, so just a note, these are actually not yet released. If you're screenshotting this or writing this down, just be aware that it's waiting its final stamp of approval from the obstetrics group here. Um, but this is the most recent version that's been approved by ID and pharmacy. Um, so just to review, the new guidelines state 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone, doxycycline for 14 days. And they do still list metronidazole as like the plus or minus that you'll see on a lot of guidelines. Um, but the addition of metronidazole is recommended by the CDC and by our local expert opinion. A reminder to advise your patients to avoid alcohol when taking metronidazole as it may induce a disulfiram reaction. I was recently told about the option of vaginally applicated metronidazole. So there are intravaginal formulations like gels or foams or dissolvable tablets. Um, and there's reportedly a decreased potential for the disulfiram reaction. Um, I spoke with a pharmacy about this. They said vaginal metronidazole is an option for uncomplicated bacterial vaginosis, but because it doesn't reach high enough serum concentrations, it really shouldn't be used in PID. Another question that comes up a lot is, can I give the ceftriaxone IV instead of IM? Because that injection is very painful. And the short answer is yes. Both routes of administration achieve appropriate serum concentrations above the MIC for gonorrhea. If you are giving the IM dose of ceftriaxone, you can dilute it with lidocaine instead of saline to make it less painful. Uh, and then we're just going to take a moment here to talk about mycoplasma genitalium. So more and more literature is starting to recognize this organism as a pathogen involved with PID, cervicitis, and urethritis. Its exact role in pathogenesis has not been fully elucidated, but it's been reported to be present in up to 35 to 40% of PID cases. Those numbers are really variable depending on where you look, but those are the highest ones reported. It's actually not part of our usual testing for PID, so it won't grow on our usual swabs. Um, but it's something you can consider in patients who are returning to the emergency department with unresolving infections. And sorry, I said grow, but I meant detected. It's a, it's a PCR test. 
Um, so we are able to test for mycoplasma if we want by sending a specific PCR swab to the Ontario Public Health Lab uh, with approval from the microbiologist on call. So we're going to take just a moment to talk about swabs. Um, so I, I went on a bit of a mission to track down what our lab is using and what the sensitivities are for our, for our assays. Um, the first number listed here is the sensitivity for chlamydia testing, and then on the right you have the sensitivity for gonorrhea testing. I'll draw your attention to the vaginal swab, um, both self-collected and provider-collected, so the bottom two rows in this chart, because um, they actually had the best sensitivities from the study that I came across. Um, but during COVID times, remember that our lab is requesting that we use urine samples just because PCR medium is at a premium. Um, this, this data here came from sort of an external study that looked at um, the Roche machine that our lab uses. The manufacturer data that comes um, along with the machine that, that the lab provided me has almost 100% sensitivity listed for everything. Um, but it actually came from, whereas this data I'm presenting here like very clearly came from a study that compared the swabs to um, like three other PCR machines that have been um, that have been already validated for, for GNC. So you're, the numbers you find will vary, but the bottom line is they're all good and vaginal swabs are just as good, if not better, than endocervical and urine samples. If you do diagnose PID in a patient with an IUD, you don't need to remove it. Um, all of the current PID treatment guidelines recommend leaving it in place, and it should only be removed if patients fail initial outpatient therapy. Many patients are at high risk for STI and PID, are also patients who are at high risk for unwanted pregnancy. So we can stop talking about PID now. What are our take home points? I recommend that we increase our suspicion and lower our diagnostic threshold for PID. Understanding that it's underrecognized and the pelvic exam is suggested to have poor inter-rater reliability and the rates of long-term complications are high. Our new treatment guidelines from the CDC and TOH recommend the following prescription for PID. Both sets of guidelines have alternate options in case of allergies, pregnancy, or other considerations, which I have not discussed here, but I do have a slide that I can touch on afterwards if people are interested. I also can't see the whole chat right now, but I can sort of see things popping up briefly along the top, and I think there was some discussion around um, doxycycline and how unpleasant it is for people to take. Um, if you do have concerns about that, um, the if you do use azithromycin, they're just recommending now that you do the one gram PO uh, in the department and then another gram PO a week later. Um, and they're recommending that for both uh, PID and regular like non-PID coverage as well. So to finish up, we're just gonna take the last part of our discussion to focus on some tools to help you optimize the procedure with your patients. Uh, first, we're just going to talk quickly about teenagers. Um, so teenagers who have not been sexually active with insertive intercourse should not have a speculum exam. But remember that these patients are still at risk of PID, as sexually transmitted infections can spread via other forms of sexual contact. If you're asking your teenage patient if they're sexually active and they say no, be sure to clarify exactly what, the mean, what they mean by that, as this is a great population to take advantage of urine and AT testing or self-swabs for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Also, consider throat swabs for gonorrhea and chlamydia in patients with persistent or non-resolving pharyngitis. Any patient with a vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, or ovaries is at risk of gynecologic pathology. For transgender patients, ask where they're at in their transition. Are they on hormones? Have they had surgery? If so, which ones? In Canada, there's only a few clinics that are currently doing bottom surgery, meaning many patients transitioning will still have pelvic organs from their sex assigned at birth. For patients on hormone therapy, remember that testosteroneized vaginas get smaller and atrophy, so use a smaller speculum or even a pediatric speculum if you have access to it. And consider using the neutral phrase genital exam rather than pelvic exam and mirror the language that, patient, that patients use for their own anatomy.
We're going to take just a moment to talk about pelvic exam in, in a patient who has experienced sexual assault. So for some patients, the pelvic exam is a lot different than an abdominal or cardiac exam. And there can be a complex relationship with this exam. So how do we approach it? I spoke with Dr. Carrie Samsel on how to come at this exam from a trauma-informed perspective. And here are some of her pearls of wisdom. Ensure you're providing a very detailed explanation of the exam prior to starting. And then explain each step again as you're doing the exam. Remind your patient that they can tell you to stop at any point. Luckily, here at TOH, we have our excellent sexual assault and partner abuse care team. But if you do find yourself being involved in, uh, with a patient who needs the exam for both medical and forensic purposes, ensure that all required tasks are done at the same time. You can avoid doing the exam twice. And transgender populations are at a high risk for sexual assault, and these assaults can often be of a more violent nature. The exam in this scenario should take extra care to assess for vaginal or cervical lacerations, as well as rectal trauma. And probably most importantly, nearly one in three women have a lifetime history of sexual assault. So the first part of your trauma-informed approach is to screen for this on every history before every exam. I also like to ask the patient if they've had a poor experience with the pelvic exam in the past, or if they've ever had a provider, if they've ever had a provider that's needed to switch to a smaller speculum on previous exam. This way you can just make the whole experience more comfortable right off the bat. Don't forget to ask your pregnant patients if this is a desired pregnancy. For many patients, we may be the first medical contact they've had regarding their pregnancy. Several members of the obstetrics group mentioned this to me that patients are often afraid to ask about abortion services. And if the patient is interested, we are able to appropriately refer or even initiate medical abortive therapy from the eMERGE. Remember that we do have a handout on SharePoint for medical and surgical options, like the clinics that you can refer them to. So if you go on SharePoint and search abortion, it's the second option that comes up. For unstable patients, so your vaginal bleeds that come into recess or emergent, um, those beds don't break in half, so that can be pretty annoying when trying to maneuver the speculum. Try flipping it upside down, and this way the handle won't be getting caught on the bed. And for patients who have had multiple children or have a higher BMI, the vaginal walls can obstruct your view when you're looking at the cervix. In these cases, there are several tricks to optimize your view. One option is to cut off the end of a condom and place it over the speculum. Condoms are available at the SAC office. Another option is to use two tongue depressors to hold the lateral walls of the vagina out of the way. Or you can even insert a small second speculum sideways after the large speculum is inserted in the usual position. There's guidance that exists from the SOGC, the CMPA, and the CPSO regarding considerations and sensitive exams. One of the main points to remember about chaperones is that both you or the patient can request to have a chaperone present. Every patient should be given the option to have a chaperone of their choice, but if you want a chaperone from a medical legal standpoint, this should be another healthcare provider. Common themes that came up in emergency department CMPA cases around obstetrical and gynecologic complaints include a lack of investigation, for example, foregoing an exam or ultrasound, and poor communication. Thorough documentation of your comprehensive discussion is recommended. Include that you spoke with the patient about the option of the pelvic exam, the thought process around inpatient versus outpatient investigations, and chart your comprehensive return to emergency instructions. Gynecologic and obstetrical presentations do carry a higher medical legal risk compared to other presentations in the eMERGE. We're going to end things off on a lighter note. So if you, like me, are very sick of the lamp in Urgent Care 7 at the General that always falls down and gets in your way, consider keeping a headlamp in your bag or use the ENT headlamp. You might look a little bit ridiculous, but I bet your frustration around performing the exam will decrease substantially. And my favorite thing to do with this, I actually ran into Nate Murray at sale last summer uh, when he was in search of a headlamp for this exact reason. Um, there unfortunately were no stand-up paddle boards um, due to supply chain issues, which is why I was there, but Nate had success. 
uh, this was the headlamp that he opted for. Um, and incidentally, I just looked it up. It's on sale, that sale right now for anyone interested. On that note, I think that's enough from me. So it's time to wrap it up. We'll take one more minute to just quickly review what we talked about. So for early pregnancy bleeding, we do not have enough evidence to unify our practice pattern. We need to ensure we're having thorough discussions with our patients about the goal of the pelvic exam and discuss, discuss the potential for therapeutic benefits as well as the idea of alternate non-pregnancy related diagnoses. A normal pelvic exam does not help us classify someone as low risk for a topic. And this is our outpatient PID prescription based on the new CDC guidelines and local recommendation. As we talked about before, metronidazole is still listed as optional, um, both on the TOH guidelines and with Public Health Agency of Canada, but the CDC recommends it as do our local expertise and as do I. Remember our tips and tricks to optimize the patient exam for both you and the patient. I hope you feel empowered to take on your next urgent care shift and improve obstetrical and gynecologic care in the emergency department. Thanks so much. Happy to take any questions.